Hello, everybody. It's good to be here. Can y'all say forward together? Forward Not one step back. Forward together. Not one step back. Great, great, great. I've got some information in the car. I'd like somebody to step out and get for me real quick some paperwork. It is good to be here in West Virginia. Now, we're here COVID safe. So y'all know what that means. We couldn't tell everybody to come in person. But guess what? We got something called social media. <laughs> and that means we got we have thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who are listening in from all around the, the world, all over West Virginia, uh, who are taking these matters that we're going to be talking about today extraordinarily seriously. I use that word extraordinarily serious because these are extraordinarily serious times. And this is an extraordinarily serious forum and press conference that we have. To all of the press that's on the line from around the country, we thank you for press that's in the room. Uh, we thank you for being here today because today you're going to be hearing from people from West Virginia. West Virginia. Before we start, I want to welcome our co-chair, Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris, to also come and take a seat up here with us. Where is she? There's Liz. Amen. Liz Theo Harris. And I want to welcome, I first saw this guy on CNN. He was talking, and I said, what is wrong with him? He's got a degree from Harvard. Why is he talking about poor people like this? Why is he fighting for poor people? And I kept hearing it, and then I would cut and say, there's something wrong with him. He's not supposed to be doing this, according to the way people think, you know. And then the more I listened, I found out he was leading one of the number one voices in, in economics on the issue of poverty and, and, we're, and making the case that it is the scarcity, the lie of scarcity is a lie. <laughs> uh, the lie that we don't know what to do is a lie. <laughs> what we have is a, uh, a scarcity of conscience, a scarcity of um, moral consciousness. And, and I was so moved, uh, knowing, in fact, that there was a time when, when the economics was not studied apart from moral philosophy. And the, here, this, this, I call him young. I guess he was young when I first started saying that. He's getting a little gray now. But none other than he's just come, coming back from the G20. Uh, he's t totally involved. Are you going to Glasgow? He's got headed over to Glasgow. But when West Virginia said, you all would like him to come to West Virginia, he said, give me the day, and I'll take the He missed the flight this morning, went to New Newark, and still got on another flight. He said, I'm not missing this today. Would you all welcome economist Jeffrey Sachs the Center for Ethics? You all know in the Poor People's Campaign, we say we don't want to be loud and wrong. We want to be loud and right. Now, I'm going to give you some data for just a quick while we're here, uh, members of the media, because a lot is being said. 42% of people in West Virginia are poor and low wealth. That's why we're challenging Senator Manchin. We don't understand what in the world is going on with him and the people in West Virginia. They're going to tell you today why he's not championing. Uh, he should be championing more for the Build Back Better plan and more even for infrastructure. Uh, we, we, it's confusing why he would block $15 living wage when in West Virginia, there's 750,000, 7,000 residents that are poor and low wealth, 48 percent of children, 183,000, 43 percent of women, of women, 399,000 women, 49 percent people of color. 65,000, and watch this, 41% of white people, 692,000 of the people in West Virginia are white, which counters the narrative in this state that poverty is just a black issue or a brown issue. From 1979 to 1912, the top 1%, that's Manchin, the top 1% income grew by 61%. But the bottom 99 either remained stagnant or decreased here in West Virginia. In West Virginia, 53,000 veterans have incomes below $35,000 a year. 53,000. And 33% of, that's 33% of all the veterans in West Virginia who fought for this country, they come back here and they have less than $35,000 a year. In eco ec ecology and health, 133 people in West Virginia are uninsured. And West Virginia has fought the expansion of Medicaid. 133,000 people are uninsured. 46% of the census tracts in West Virginia are at risk for even being able to afford water. 
40, that's what we're talking about, members of the media. That's what we're talking about, nation. Why is this senator against his own people and also hurting other states? 70,000 tons of nitrogen oxen are admitted in West Virginia yearly. It is a leading cause of respiratory problems, and West Virginia is the eighth highest total in the entire country. 1,300 people every, are homeless. You can work in West Virginia and this state at a minimum wage, and, uh, and it will take you 66 hours of work per week just to afford a basic two-bedroom apartment. And 352,000 workers make under $15 an hour. Watch this. That's half of the state. Not 40% of the state, not 30% of the state. Half of the state doesn't make $15 basic minimum living wage. And your, this senator said no to half. Now, I want everybody to notice one thing you're going to notice at this thing. You haven't heard me say Republican or Democrat. I just said half and thousands. You haven't heard me say uh, uh, of those people working for less than what, black or white or brown. I said half. Have. This is not about Democrat versus Republican and conservative versus what did Manchester say the other day, center right? What is that? This is about doing the right thing by people who are in the center of economic turmoil. That's what this is about. And this forum press conference today is to be in conversation with Dr. Jeffrey Sachs and more importantly for him to answer some questions from West Virginians, your forum to answer some questions from you that can go out all over the nation because, you know, I, 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 tr I try not to use that L-I-E word, but there comes a time you just got to call it what it is. There's a lot of lying been going on. And I don't have anything against your, your senator from a personal standpoint, but I have a lot of problems as with you with his public policy because he goes to West Virginia and he tells the other leaders there he can't do these things because you all don't want it. That's what he says in the back room. That's what he says in the front room. That's what he says on CNN. He says, I'm doing what West Virginians want. My state is a center-right state, and they don't want a big BBB. They don't want $15 minimum pay. They don't want to rein in the issues that are hurting our climate. That's what he said. But the question is, what do you say? Now, as we prepare, we had a program, but we've got one couple uh, they've got to get out of here at 2.30. And since this is your forum <laughs> and, 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 and we're just facilitating it, I want to ask Hunter Sparks, I want them to come and raise their question so that the rest of the nation can hear the kinds of things we're going to talk about. Then I'm going to c come back and turn it over for Dr. Sack just to give an opening. And then we're going to go into this forum and hear from you and these questions all over the country, but most of all right here in West Virginia. So, so um, Hunter, Hunter Spock, come on and share with what what is it that you want to raise? If, if, we need another mic. We, I need one that's sprayed, and, and you know how we have to do. Should they do it from the, from the audience? No, I want them to come up here where she can they can see. We have oh yeah, camera. No, no, lead us here. Give her that. Okay, that's right. Thank you. Appreciate your okay. <laughs> um, Thank you all for allowing me to speak. And I'll allow me to time my, my, I have to pick up my daughter from school at 2.30. Um, uh, my name How long have you been in West Virginia, by the way? My whole life. I was born here in Charleston. You were born here in Charleston? And what, what's Ka, Ka, say the name of the county? Kanawa. 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 That was the original people here, right? The Kanawa people. The Kanawa. So you Charleston. born here. You raised here. You got West Virginia in your blood. You West Virginia born, West Virginia bred. When you die, you're going to be West Virginia dead. That how it go? Okay. All right. Talk to us. I want y'all to know that's West Virginia. Yeah. I, um, I wrote down what I wanted to say. Um, so basically, thank you um, to the Poor People's Campaign. Yeah. Um, thank you for having me. Yeah, you can channel. do that. Um, for uh, allowing me the space to be here and speak to my experiences. And uh, uh, thanks for being here to... Uh, speak with us and share your wisdom with us. Um, so my name's Hunter Starks. I'm a single parent um, to an incredible daughter. Her name's PK. She's four. Um, when my daughter was born, um, 
I was in a better place than a lot of my peers. I had a really, really good job in student, I mean, in my <laughs> like, when I graduated from college. I worked for the state. Um, I had made enough money to get by, and I thought I was doing really great um, when my daughter went back to, went to daycare at 12 weeks old. Um, daycare was $195 a week. Um, that was 60% of uh, my net, my take-home income. And um, I didn't qualify for help uh, with child care. Um, I made too much. Um, so it was quite literally impossible for me to afford to work and live independently. Um, at the same time, uh, within a month of me going back to work, my grandmother fell. Um, and I was, I was lucky to have PTO to be able to take 12 weeks, but I had to use all my PTO while I took those 12 weeks to be with my teeny tiny baby daughter. Mm. And I asked for one day off a week so that I could, my family and I were trying to take time, like take shifts basically to be there with my grandma. She lived in a multi-story home. She hadn't. And, you know, she had to be in a wheelchair, and um, that was denied because I didn't have any PTO, because I, had, I, I said, I'll take time, I'll take unpaid time off. They said no. Um, I'm a firm believer that, like, I, um, I've been working since I was 15 and usually multiple jobs, and I kind of like working, <laughs> like, too much sometimes. Um, but I... How many jobs you work? Right now, I work two jobs. Two jobs, yeah. don't have paid family leave, mm -mm. and can't afford insurance. How do you feel about when, when Senator Manchin says, well, we need to do that in another bill, because I can get some Republicans to come over. And if you just give me a chance, and we can do it in another bill. How do you feel that he wants to do another bill rather than just do right in this bill? I think there's been tons of opportunities forever to do this and just do it now. Let's um, do it now. And mm -hmm. why I can't. I get mad. <laughs> get mad. This is your forum. You, this is time to tell it. Yeah. yeah. But I, I work to take care of my family, um, and family is my priority. Um, I ended up making uh, some hard decisions. Um, I left my job, which could have been a career with, with a... a like retirement plan, but I just could like it just didn't work. As a single parent, I um, I left that so job. So public policy forced you to leave your job. Yeah. Not you didn't. It was the pub, bad public policy made you make a choice to leave a job that could have been a career job because Mansion and, and the other senators aren't doing the things they need to do to make sure you could at least have leave. I couldn't. And insurance. Have I got you. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I've, um, I've lived in poverty ever since, and um, if I'm totally honest, um, I've struggled some in college, but um, I've never lived in poverty like I have as a single parent. Um, I didn't grow up in poverty. Well, well, now, that's an important point, because people need to understand what po these policies are doing. You didn't grow up in poverty. No. You were working. You didn't. All you want, you, you never said, I don't want to work. You want to work. You just said, I need the paid leave, I need the insurance, those kind of things. And now, because of policy, you are in what you didn't even grow up in. So it's kind of, you know, normally they say if you grow up poor, you end up poor, so, so. You're the opposite in West Virginia. Yeah, I had to get a, a special permit to be able to work at 15 because I wanted to, because, you know, I needed money. <laughs> um, yeah, um, and aside from that, <laughs> in past four years, you know, I've been become acquainted to the sort of sit and wait for tax season reality of um, being poor. Um, if I need something done with my car, if I uh, need something done with my house, if I need to pay off medical debt, <laughs> um, it's not possible until I get my income tax return. And um, ironically, I use my income tax return to pay my property taxes on my car because I mm. can't afford month yeah. to month to pay it. It doesn't make sense. And it's frustrating. But well, it's not because you're immoral and you don't you don't want to work and you know because that's what they say. They say if people are poor. They, that's their own fault. This is a direct result of policies that could have been changed a long time ago just to get people out. You you think Mansion struggles like this? No. <laughs> 
He no, didn't. he certainly doesn't. Does he represent you when he says that he doesn't want these things? He's supposed to. <laughs> but does he? In, in his positions, in his policies? He, I don't think he does. And um, I think he's way too comfortable not representing us. Mm, okay. <laughs> comfortable not representing the people that are supposed to be rep. Let's have a few more comments and then we're going to, I know you got to go and we want to, we're going to get some other question, people in. But I wanted folk to hear this all over the country. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to come. Um, basically, I think it's like really frustrating and sometimes frankly scary that I have to wait for that money every year for my income tax return. And, um, you know, that's money that rightfully belongs to my family as, you know, members of the work before we work and it comes back to us. And that's right. Instead of having access to an income and budget that works and allows me to save and be ready for emergencies, I just have to sit and wait for that every year. Um, so basically there's a lot in the Build Back Better bill that would have prevented a lot of difficulty in my life and would prevent further difficulty and that would help make things better for my family right now. And, um, you know, I was just hoping that um, this space could speak to that reality and how Build Back Better would improve Great. the lives of families like mine and the reality that I very firmly believe that um, helping individual families also helps all of us as a whole and as a nation to move forward and do better and grow together. One question I want to ask you, because this is another piece we got to clear up. Your reality did not start with COVID. It, it got worse during COVID. It did not. In other words, the things you're talking about, you needed them before COVID. Yeah. That's why you say it could have been done a long time ago. Because there's a group that's saying, well, people got all this stuff during COVID, and now you all think you're entitled. But this is not an entitlement for you. This is something that you need. All you want is the right thing to be done and basic justice so you can live and take care of your family. That's what I hear. Yeah, I think it's pretty gross to refer to just a basic, decent quality of life as an entitlement. Mm. And it's not because of COVID that COVID just highlighted I, I, problems okay, that okay. Okay. are already here. Right, yeah. I think it's, 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 it's people think they got a sense of entitlement when they have millions and millions in voting power and they think they're entitled to get up every morning and block other people from the kind of public policy that's needed. I think that's a gross form of entitlement. Yeah. Well, I know your pronouns are they and them, and we certainly thank you for you coming and family. I know you've got to leave, so check out the live stream so you can hear Dr. Sachs' response to some of your uh, points. But we wanted people to see where we're going. This is a serious business, a serious forum. Mr. Manchin, you need to hear from your people. And by the way, thank you. Give her a hand. Give her a big hand. Y'all fired up? It's, it's nothing wrong with being upset about this. You should be upset about what's going on. We're not, we're not, old folks used to say, I'm not going to scratch when I'm not itching and I'm not going to smile when nothing's funny. And nothing's funny about this. Uh, this is, this is hurting in people's lives. And when people go and undergird somebody like Manchin, you become an accessory to the crime. When you tell him it's all right and it's fine and you pat him on the back, you become an accessory. To, to these people's lives, destruction. We already know that people die from poverty, from poverty. And, 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 and uh, one day we're going to do a measurement of that right here in West Virginia. Let's give it up for the tri-chairs of the West Virginia Poor People's Campaign. Where are they? We all, I see two of them. Any more? We got third? There's two right now. So we thank, thank God for them. How many, uh, uh, you got some numbers for me? You got some numbers for me, Eric? Rob, I need some numbers of how many folk are online. And I need a letter I'm going to read, and then I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Sachs. Uh, Rob, give me that. I mean, uh, Robin, give me, some, give me some estimates across the country. What are you talking about? Give me some estimates. Hurry up. Give me in three minutes. Have me some estimates. Three minutes. You and Rob get together. This is a letter from members of the media and um, um, that... Uh, I'm going to have read toward the end by one of the, by the people here, but I wanted to just give you a line in it. Those of you that are online, the media, the people from West Virginia Public are sending a letter directly to uh, West uh, to President Biden because for months they've been asking for meetings with Manchin. He always says, "Well, I'm busy today, but check back later." But their deeper concern is we've been asking the handlers of the president 
to, they've been asking, meet with us. You've met with Manchin, you've met with the lobbyists, you've met with the, bring some people from West Virginia who are poor and low wealth and other states, Mr. President, and meet with them in the White House of every race, creed, and color. Hear from them. And so this letter is going to be released uh, today, and West Virginians are going to be signing on to it. It says, um, we, we have asked... Uh, excuse me, it says we have um, asked Senator Joe Manchin to meet with us. We've called, petitioned, stood outside of his office in West Virginia and in D.C. He refuses to meet with the very people he says he represents. He does not speak for us. Mr. President, you promised to build back better, but you need to know us in order to do it right. For months, we have watched you, Mr. President, meet with senators, lobbyists, as you work out a Build Back Better plan. After weeks and months of asking your staff to meet with us, we are now asking you directly in this open letter, why won't you sit down with us? We are the West Virginia Poor People's Campaign. We are representatives of the 700,000 people in our state that are poor and low wealth. And it's high time we, the people, not the lobbyists, not the senators, not them, but we, the people who experience the pain and who would benefit from Build Back Better, have the opportunity to sit with you, talk with you, and then speak to the nation so that America can see herself by hearing and seeing us. How y'all like that? This is going out from West Virginia. They're going to read the whole, it'll be read in totality at the end. Give me some, Eric. Thousands. We got thousands of people. What's that? In the five or the tens? We got tens of thousands of people online all over the country. Come on, give us, give us a hand. That are listening in. And we got other folks that are cross-posting. And a lot of those thousands are right here in West Virginia. Dr. Sachs, I've been long enough. Come and open us up, and then after you open, we're going to take some questions from the people. Give, give him a fresh microphone. Thank you. for the media folks. <laughs> well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for welcoming me. I'm really honored to be here. I'm so excited to be part of uh, this campaign. And I'm here because it's so weird what's going on. It's unbelievable. First of all, I travel all over the world. I see a lot of, lot of things in a lot of places. We're the only country like this struggling with these basic issues. I was in Norway last week. You think they don't have free childcare, free family leave for everybody that needs it? Of course they do. Health care, universal. No problem. Costs of schooling all the way through not only community college, any level, any level, free. Because that's normal, ladies and gentlemen. They tell you, oh, you can't do that, but most of the countries like us do it. We're in a very weird time in this country. And I'm here to learn from you and to listen because I can't figure out how West Virginia can have a senator who works overtime to stop the most basic things that the people of this state need. So I'll just put a little bit on the table to get us started. On average, we're a rich country. That's because there are a few people with so much and a lot of people that are struggling like we just heard. We could solve all these problems without breaking a sweat. I just looked it up. Elon Musk, you heard of him? Tesla? Okay, so today, this morning, his wealth is 
$312 billion. All right, so I thought, suppose you make $40,000 a year, and you're going to go to work, and you're going to continue to work until you make $312 billion. How long do you think that would take you? Thousand years? No. Five thousand years? No. Ten thousand years? No. A million years? No. Seven million years. Wow. And then, when the idea was maybe you should pay something in tax, your senator said, "No way! That'd be dangerous." What is going on in this country? Honestly, what is going on with your senator? It's unbelievable. Right now, the companies in this country are paying the lowest share of national income and corporate taxation in modern history because the taxes have been cut and cut and cut and cut. Forty years ago, before all this nonsense started, and handing all the money to the rich, the companies paid three to four percent of our national income in taxes. Now they pay one percent because it's been slashed and slashed and slashed, including in that 2017. <coughs> tax cut that everybody knew was unaffordable, except the rich people wanted it, so they got it. So when President Biden says, and I wanted him to just eliminate what had been done in 2017, why keep any of that tax cut, That's which right. just went to the richest people? That's right. But President Biden, you know, he's a moderate man, so he said, We'll take it back halfway to where it was. And your senator said no for this state. And then he says, oh, my God, there's no money to do all these things. Well, that's the money, Senator. Mm. What are you talking about? If you fight every tax on the richest people in the world and then you say there's no money, Aren't you playing a game? And maybe that's the game we saw when he was trying to drive his Maserati out of the garage. I didn't know he had a Maserati. I didn't know he had a houseboat. I didn't know he had $8 million of income, a mega millionaire. He's just voting his pocket, not yours. It's unbelievable. Oh, God, I don't have any easy answers of what to do because this guy is just completely abusive to his own population here. Mm -hmm. Yes, abusive. That's right. That's right. That's right. And it. Because there's nothing complicated about any of this. There's nothing complicated about any of this. The idea of this whole package from the start was the rich have gotten so unbelievably rich. The whole political system has worked for them for decades. And by the way, you know why it's not very complicated. The campaigns, okay, cost $14 billion of donations in 2020. Mm. We call that legal. That's just corruption. Yep. That's, right. That's all it is. Yeah. But our country is really twisted right now. But then they get trillions of dollars of tax cuts. Yep. That's the game. And the game is so clear and so obvious. So the idea of the package was really simple. Take some of this and have, let people, let this wonderful mother have some child care, for God's sake. Are you kidding? 
family leave, take care of an elderly parent, some help in this country, which every other country does. Every other country. So that's all it was. And then, oh my God, because they twist every number, every lie. So you start hearing, oh, it's trillions, it's trillions. And then Manchin, so oh, we can't afford that. As if nobody would do the most basic, honest arithmetic. You know what this package is right now, after it's been cut and cut and cut? It's not even 1% of our income in this country. Mm. Can't afford that, Senator? Well, yeah, if you have to give everything to the rich so you don't take a penny from them, then you can't afford it. Mm. But if you just collected some tax from these companies, some tax from the billionaires, there's no problem affording it. We're talking about small numbers. They sound like big numbers. Because when they say, by the way, it infuriates me, they say, oh, it's a $1.75 trillion. First of all, that's over 10 years. So that's $175 billion a year. Okay, is that a big number? Well, it is for you and me, not so much for Elon. But for our nation, no, we're $23 trillion output. It's much less than 1%. But they make it, oh my God, we can't afford this. It's going to be inflation. We're going to go broke. It's a game, ladies and gentlemen. You know it. And when Manchin said this, and I am one of the most experienced macroeconomists in the world. I've been doing this for 41 years and working on this for countries all over the world. And Manchin said these completely wrong things. So I called. Happy to talk to you, Senator. No answer. So I called a friend of his. No answer. Then someone else said, I know him. Okay, I'd like to talk to him. No answer. Mm -hmm. Then I realized he won't talk to you. That's right. The voters. Because he's not confused, he knows exactly what he's doing as he gets into his Maserati and out of his Maserati and looks at his millions in his bank account. He's not representing the people of West Virginia at all. He left you behind, but unfortunately, this is our political corrupted system. That's what we're seeing. A government of the rich, by the rich, for the rich. And these numbers are tiny and so easily filled because we're talking about basic needs for basic people. We're not talking about extravagance. We're talking about people making ends meet in this country. It's a dis well, it's more than a disgrace. It is just a tragedy. I've been doing this for 41 years. I don't recognize this country because it has been down, down, down for 41 years. I date it to Ronald Reagan taking over and that's cutting up. taxes. Because I watched it then, and it just continues and it continues. And the game was let the companies pay all the money to the politicians and don't say anything about it. That's our Supreme Court's game. Lewis Powell said, oh, that's just free speech. That won't hurt democracy. Just sell it to the highest bidder. So for 41 years, it's been tax breaks and tax cuts for the rich and people who have money that we couldn't even imagine you could have one person with $300 billion. The whole thing is so ridiculous and surrealistic but they don't pay any tax on the way and then mansion just has the temerity to say we can't afford child care 
for this woman. Come on. As the president says, come on. Well, why doesn't he come here and come on? That's right. Because the other thing that happened as our politics got so damn corrupt in this country, so ruthlessly corrupt, is that politicians don't even come out to see anybody anymore. You watch what's happening right now. Every day, someone comes out and says, well, Manchin doesn't like that, so that's off the table. Mm, mm, mm. And the next one, oh, cinema doesn't like that, so that's off the table. And no, we won't tax the billionaires because that, that one's off the table. And then uh, prescription drug prices, no, no, three congressmen, well, that's off the table. Who the hell are these people? Yeah. That's right. That's what are they doing? Where are the hearings? Where are the discussions? That's right. That's None right. of it. That's it's right. all behind closed doors because that's how plutocracy works. It's all behind closed doors. Hmm. Every number is phony. All the press with its corporate ownership, oh, we couldn't do this without telling you that every other country does it and does it easily. So that's what, well, anyway, we're here with a great leader and a great community and great fighters. So I'm just here to share a couple facts with you. You're on a thousand percent the right track. And I just wanted to come here because I can't stand what's happening to you people by your senator. It's a disgrace. Thank Mama. you. Mama. Thank you. You know, sometimes there's a scripture in the Bible, and Liz and I often talk about it. Amos says raw truth. People don't like just raw truth. But that's what we need if we're going to have any chance of turning this around, and, and we are. We're going to have to have raw truth. We're going to have to have a commitment to mass mobilization. We want you all to know that's why on Monday we're going back to D.C., and then Beyond all of this, June 18th, 2022, the largest, most consequential gathering of poor and low wealth people, economists and religious advocates and others are going to gather. And I think we're going to get some, some friends around the world to maybe gather. Dr. Sachs and Liz and I are going to be talking about that, that do something also. So it's a worldwide poor people's uh, mass, poor people's low wage workers assembly in Moral March on D.C. What y'all think about that? Now. And, and, and it's not going to be a day, it's going to be a declaration that, that we're not taking it anymore. It's got to come from behind these closed doors, and we're going to use every nonviolent method and the 40% of the voting population that we now represent. We can no longer vote based on personality. We have to come together and vote on an agenda. One of us may be, not be that consequential, but if we vote as a group, uh, as a people with an agenda, that's when one of the ways transformation can come. Now, I did not do a big introduction of Jeffrey Sachs because it's how I'm trained in church. They taught me when I was coming up in the church <clears throat> that folk that want an introduction most times don't deserve it. <laughs> and folk that deserve one, done. So now, members that may not know in media, Jeffrey Sachs is a world-renowned professor. Uh, uh, he's a senior UN advisor. You need to know that. He's been at Columbia University, finished at Harvard. He, he leads uh, an academy and economic advisory team at the uh, Vatican. And I say those things to say it now. This is not some, you know, when people like uh, a Jeffrey Sachs gets upset, it's something really to get upset about. And I'm not suggesting that when we get upset, but he, uh, he gets upset because he knows the numbers. We upset. We know the pain. We don't even know all the stuff behind the scenes. He does. And he knows when they're lying. He's sitting right there saying, that's a lie. That's a lie. And that's why movements need people like Jeffrey Sachs, and Jeffrey Sachs need movements like us. And we put all of that together. And there's a whole lot more of him around here. And so at this time, we still got thousands of people are on. We have Steve that's um, actually doing a blow-by-blow, blow, pushing it out. Where's our other media sister? Where is she? Where's Liz with you? Where's your? 
Lauren, where's Lauren? She's over there working. Yolanda's working. Give them a hand. They're pushing this out all over the country. I do want you all to text that out and push it out. The tax just referred to what's going on as abusive. We got to use that kind of language. This is economically and politically abusive, abusive. And Dr. Sachs, the first thing while you're sitting there, I want to ask you to respond to the first lady that they said, I'm a paraphrase, then Liz is going to introduce. Each person is going to raise something and ask something, and then if you could respond to it. Now, um, Starks, was it Starks? Right. She said, that, how, how, let's go at it in this way, paid leave and child care. What is the real cost of not doing it. You know, your colleague Joe Stiglitz says sometimes we ask the question, well, what does it cost to do it? I want to get away from whether it's a co would cost a trillion dollars or cost what. What is the real damage that is done to society, the economic damage that's done to society when a society says, I'm not going to provide basic child care and I'm not going to provide basic paid leave. What, from a mac macro sense, what what's really happens to us? Well, it's, it's macro cruelty, as you just heard. Uh, you saw, we all saw the emotion, the pain, the horrible choices that this wonderful woman has faced. Keep a job or not. Tend to her daughter or not. It's unbelievable to be pushed into that circumstance. The cruelty of it is phenomenal. And you multiply that millions of times, and you end up with a country that is cruel to its people. And the point about this is every other developed country figured this out a long time ago. You can get online and look. There's a group of countries called the OECD. Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development. It's basically our pure countries. It's Canada, it's the United Kingdom, it's France, it's Germany, it's Italy, it's Sweden, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Finland. All of them have paid leave. All of them, all of them. We're the only country in the world that doesn't. Mm. Mm. So, because it's obvious. We're cruel to people here. What are we thinking? Well, I know. It's because our political system went haywire. It's because the political system is behind the closed doors. So the one thing you can't do is tax rich people. That's the story. Not only you, you have to give them deals all the time. Mm -hmm. Mr. Bezos, you know, Sorry, he's only $190 billion. He's a poor guy compared to Elon Musk now. What does he do for Amazon? He goes around the country, says, who will give me the biggest tax breaks? I don't want to pay taxes. I don't want to pay any local taxes. I don't want to pay any state taxes. I don't want to buy any land. You owe it to me. You want some jobs in the warehouse? You give me all of that stuff. This is what happened in this country. So then we end up collecting the smallest revenues as a share of our big national income of any of these countries in this group, by far. Then they say, we can't afford it. That's a game. It's a game. By the way, I don't recommend it, and I, I, mean, and I know you won't, but I have to for work. I have to I don't read know, this is a strange I, crowd that we do have, a lot of stuff. People I have to read something called the Wall Street Journal. Oh, well, we do. Yeah, we get mad about it, but it we read it. It is so disgusting you can't even imagine. But all it is, every day on the editorial page is propaganda, how the only way our country can make it is to give everything to the rich people. You take anything, everything's going to fall to pieces. Everything will fall to pieces unless the rich people get everything because they're so fragile. Yeah. Let me ask this. Billions. But us? No. This is, this is the game. Let me ask one other question. Now take us to school a little bit in economics. So if we did pay leave, get paid leave, and if yeah. we did provide child, because they always tell us the cost 
you know, it, it would cost too much, it would outweigh the benefit. But actually, in, fi in money, is there a benefit to the whole country? I mean, not only in terms of just treating people right, but somewhere we found out that a moral budget is also an economically sound budget. It's economically insane not to invest in your people. Talk a little bit about what would happen if we had made that investment. God forbid people would be healthier. Okay. People would be happier. People would live longer. Do you know the life expectancy in the United States now ranks somewhere around 40th in the world? Because we're letting people die. Poor people. It's really something. Because my career spans the period when we were at the top. Now we keep falling, 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 falling. Because, because when, when it comes to uh, the health care, oh, we can't afford for, to give people uh, dental, eye, and hearing. Maybe hearing. <laughs> Are you goddamn kidding? That's what they're talking about. That's right. It's unbelievable. It's like a joke. It's like a Saturday Night Live skit. Yeah. I don't care yeah, if you see. Only you can... hearing, but I and, and uh, uh, dental, why would you do that? Do you think any other civilized country talks this way? Mm. What happened is we got taken over by the richest people. And they, and Manchin, he's a multimillionaire. It's not even what the campaign donors do to him. He's it. He's just it. The Congress is filled with these millionaires. They don't even need the influence, although they also have it outside. They just vote their book. And then, by the way, which is completely weird, they regulate the companies they own. Ugh. You think you get a lot of good regulation that way, don't you? Uh, uh. That's happening all through the Congress. Because he heads like the energy, yeah. and then he's in energy. So, so Liz, let's let's. And let's, you can't. Let's, I had to look it up. There's no rule about this. Are we? What happened to us? Are we idiots in this country? Yes. Yes. We're not. By the way, we see it. Everyone yes. sees it. Right. But it still happens. Right. It's unbelievable. And, and some of it, as we go to Liz, some of it, y'all, is we're not idiots. We, the, the, they are idiots. And they they make us feel that's right. They make us feel like it. What I'm saying is we've got to decide. Even there are folk, as you say, inside of the Congress that ought to be saying, hell no. But they've decided, I got to give a little bit. I got, like you said, not a hearing or nothing. And I'm not even talking about the people who are necessarily our open adversaries. I'm talking about oftentimes, you, you, you castigate, uh, now they're trying to blame Congressman Jayapal for everything and the Progressive Caucus. I read an article just the other day, because of them, the country's going, to, and that's when Manchin came out. That's foolishness, but that is why what you're hearing today is what should embolden and intensify our agitation about this movement. Now, we got another question we want to raise. Yep. So we want to hear from a couple more folks here yeah. uh, from West Virginia to bring more of that experience into this conversation and be able to have Professor Sachs respond. So the next person um, to, to speak is, is Deidre Keith Spitzer, Switzer, who, who can bring your experience around education and around other pieces of this Build Back Better yeah, plan uh, that would impact your life and other people's lives here in West Virginia. Thanks so much for being with us. Come on, say forward together. Forward together. Not one step back. Uh, I want Deidre, okay, just thank like you. you feel it in your heart. Okay, right. well first, thank you to the Poor People's Campaign for having me. Um, I am Deidre Keys. Um, I work in Charleston. I am a college level instructor, and I work with Young WV, which is an organization that really centers um, empowering young people to engage civically and making sure that their voices are heard. Um, <laughs> Um, I'd say that I'm really fortunate to work with a diverse group of students, and these students not only exist here locally, but also exist all over the state. Um, one thing that we hear constantly is that the burden and the increasing financial burden of school um, is really challenging not only for students, but their families. Um, and I guess my work with college, student, my work with college students 
is amazing, but I also acknowledge that there have been students who are not able to access right, college due to being pushed out, whether that's financially um, or in other ways. But I guess our question, you know, on really behalf of young people is what exactly did we lose when we lost the two years, um, the two free years of community college? And what could that have meant for the futures of young West Virginians and their families? What did we lose? What did we lose? Dr. Sirs? Okay. Uh, and let me say something for you, Professor sure. Fair. I want some of us too to, to, to see the, 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 the disgust that Dr. Sachs has brought, because that's another thing we're going to have to start doing more of, is I think too often when they take stuff, we've been too nice to accept the country. Now, I'm not saying we've got to be violent, tear up stuff, but it's surely we have to have some wailing and some crying out and some speaking from our gut, because they made us, made too many people think I gotta beg you and ask you for this, and the reality is, it's ours. So, this is disgusting. This is ugly. This is mean. You take two years. Talk to Deidre, because she's one of our organizers. Thank you so much for what you're doing, and uh, you know this is one of these parts of this legislation that just bizarrely one day got thrown away because of some inside something. We're the only wealthy country that put $1.6 trillion of debt on the backs of our young people. And what happens, it's so also so obviously messed up. So many young people try to go to college and do one year and then the debt comes, and then they have to work, and then they don't finish, and then they are buried in debt and without the college degree. And this happened to a whole generation as we were watching. Again, you can't find this in Canada. You can't find this any other place. This is us. It's mean. It's really mean. So the answer is in all these other countries, somehow they're able to find a, a way to have people go to college or uh, all sorts of uh, um, specialized skills, schools, vocational, and others, and not end up with massive debt. But not us, because that's money, and that's a business, and the business is also going after these kids for the rest of their lives trying to collect this debt. So somehow, you know, there was a very good idea in here. Two years free community college. Hey, why not? I would say <laughs> same should be for four years. If you can make it, go for it. So they started two years. And then one day it dropped. Because Mr. Manchin said he can't afford it. Because he was so busy cutting the taxes of the rich that suddenly you couldn't afford it. Now, West Virginia really needs it, actually. This state has just about the lowest bachelor's degree graduates in the country as a share of the population. This, this state needs a lot of investment in education. It's crucial, especially for the kind of economy that's taking shape, because the kind of economy that's taking shape more and more needs training, needs skills. This is the basic point of what's happened for decades, by the way. The jobs have been replaced by machines. Uh -huh. This is, this is, this is how the economy goes, and if you don't, share the skills and the training and the incomes, you end up with more and more poor people who can't make it. It's obvious this has been this way for a long time. And so we need an education program. How can it be that your senator isn't the lead voice in the nation 
saying, my state demands that this remain in. What is the matter with this man? We've already determined that. Corrupted my money, it's pure and simple. But his job is to get education to this state. It's, by the way, the number one investment that any place needs in the whole world right now. I give that speech every day to every part of the world. You want to make a good investment? Invest in education. It's the only thing you can invest in right now to be sure that it's going to have a high return. Because the one thing you have is you have your mind, you have your skills, you have your ability to do different things because you have training. And if you don't, oh my God, what's going to happen as more and more jobs get robotized and machine systems and all the rest? It'll just be a growing, growing part of our society suffering. And you think, well, it is going to end because this campaign is going to end this trend that we're on. But we've been on this trend for a long time. That's and right. then one day, behind closed doors, this comes out because, quote, we can't afford it. It's like you said, Reverend, we can't afford not to do this. That's right. That's right. How are we going to be a country if people aren't educated in the 21st century? What are they? I know what they're thinking. We don't care. People are disposable. It's our wealth that matters. That's what they think. These mega millionaires and billionaires, honestly, they think people are disposable. They don't care, period. Your senator doesn't care. Because if he cared, he would have figured this out or he would have listened to somebody trying to advise him on something. He would have checked the numbers. He doesn't care. It's a game. And he's gotten away with the game for a long time. They all have. They've gotten away with this game for decades. That's right. You know, By the way, I have to say, I'm going to say something politically incorrect. That's all right. Yeah. Again and again. But, you know, I live in Manhattan. So I'd walk across Central Park. And then on the other side, on the east side, that's the ritzy side. I live on the other side. Everything would be barricaded and you couldn't walk for blocks and blocks and blocks. Why? Oh, the president's here. That's, that's, mm. that's Obama. So he drops into New York. Did he go to Harlem? Uh-uh. Did he go to the Bronx? Uh-uh. Did he go to Queens? Uh-uh. Where'd he go? Went to the Upper East Side because he was collecting campaign contributions. Not even announced. I just know, I just knew because the barricades were there, because they closed down several blocks of the city to move a president. How weird. That's a guy I liked. But our system is so twisted with money. He didn't stop to talk to poor people. He didn't go to the community. He didn't. He went to a rich person's place to collect campaign funding and then left for Washington, probably never announced. I only knew because I stumbled on the barricades. But that's what's happening all over the place. That is the point, Dr. Sachs. I'll tell you. Can I tell you uh, another yeah, yes, sir. story? Yes, sir. Okay. I'll tell you another story. I like Dr. Sachs. He's like a Baptist preacher down south, Pentecostal. <laughs> As the spirit goes, he goes. <laughs> There, there, are no, there are maybe more than two, but there are at least two Jeffrey Sachses in New York. One of them is really rich. That's not me. <laughs> All right? So I got a call from a congressman a couple weeks ago. This congressman so-and-so. It's not so unusual. I talked to congressmen. And I thought, oh, he wanted to call to talk about the bill because I know something. Well, I started, something wasn't right. And then after a couple of minutes, ah. he says to me, well, Jeff, you know, I have a difficult primary coming up. So, oh, 
Yeah. He says, well, I wanted to know if you'd make a contribution. And I, I said, God, that's weird. I thought, you know, I thought you wanted to talk about anyway. And I said, well, I, I don't because, you know, I uh, also work with the UN, so I don't get involved in that. He said, oh, but I saw you gave several thousand dollars to so-and-so. Then it dawned on me. Uh -huh. Other Jeffrey Sachs. And he's not calling at all to talk about anything. He's talking about money because that's what they do. That's what they do. Our representatives. This is someone who should have called me because I know a lot about the legislation. I know a lot about the economy. But that's not why he called. He called for a campaign contribution. That's right. And this is what's going on, ladies and gentlemen. This is a game. So, and President Biden should get out and get these out of the back rooms. I never had much confidence in Nancy Pelosi, yeah. I have to tell you. It's all back rooms. And who, who thrives in the back rooms? The rich and the lobbyists. That's right. The ones and that the congressmen who are rich themselves. That's right. That's and in right. families with lobbyists, by the way. So the whole thing is rigged. And if we talked about it honestly with real numbers, we'd actually get somewhere because then they'd say, you can't afford it? Are you kidding? It's less than 1% of our income. Can't afford it? Are you kidding? The companies used to pay four times what they're paying right now. Why can't they do it again? Because you gave them tax cuts the whole damn way. That's right. That's right. So part of what you're saying is that when we hear a mansion say something like, this is a shell game, he's really projecting what he's actually doing. Exactly. And, and that's why this campaign, what I want folk to hear, when we say shift the narrative, and be able, this is what we're talking about. We've got to get the narrative shifted, and we've got to, if they won't come where we are, we've got to go there. We've got to put people in front of this nation so that they can see themselves and see the ugliness of it. Because what you said about that trip coming in, it happens all, and that's the P. If, if you come into town and you're a politician, don't drive in certain areas, don't take the media there, then you can really say you never saw it. It's why, for, for the whole while when we started, people always wanted to say 39 million, that's the extent of poverty. They didn't want to face these numbers. Because to face it means you either have to fix it or you have to ignore it or you just have to say, I don't give a damn. Right. And, and the latter is really what you end up doing when you refuse to address them. So, Dr. Sachs, when, when we, when, when, it, that's why this is so incredibly important. Now, a um, couple of housekeeping things. If somebody said they could hear one of us. On, if you uh, are with our team and you can hear something like we're doing technically, then you need to take your two feet and come up here and tell us. Don't send me a text message. Sit, get in touch with somebody that's here and take two feet and walk up here and whisper in my ear and we'll try to fix it. I'm just housekeeping stuff, y'all. I don't get, don't send me a text message and say that you fixed it. Now, we have a lady here. She's been married for, for 42 years. Lord, that much, 42 years. And she's a fire brand. She believes in telling the truth, and she's a, uh, uh, she's grandparents and her husband were minors. She's got two children, one of them is an ICU nurse, the other is disabled. Two grandchildren, one boy, one girl, and she said to me, uh, and then Liz will bring up the next person afterwards, she said, everywhere I have lived, there's been, that we, they were mining people in southern West Virginia. Southern West Virginia, next next county is to Charleston. So I want somebody to give her a clean mic, so so you, she can come. You all know her, come right on up. They, so and only reason we're asking people to come over here is because of the filming. But Pam Garrison, would y'all give it up for five? Thank you, Reverend Barber. Thank you, Mr. Sachs, for. Uh, for coming the invitation, for taking up the invitation to come and speak with us. My heart is broken listening to all this about my, my state. This is my people. That is why we've invited Mr. Tax 
Reverend Barber and Reverend Liz to join us, to join you. This is immoral, people. This is not right. I verify what you say. Forty years I've been fighting for a minimum wage raise, and I hear the same thing every time. All the country will go disaster if you get a minimum wage raise. The deficit will be so high we can't we can't afford you to make a living wage. You got to keep struggling and straggling. Ever since our minds went down in the 80s, we have gotten sicker. We have gotten poorer. My country has went down. And I want to say, corporations are not people, too. We are the people. That's right. That's right. Citizens United just gave them the, a, a, a legal avenue to put it to us, to stomp us in the ground legally. It needs changed. We need the people to take back our government. We need the people represented there, not the corporations. I, I'm heartbroken today uh, fighting these battles. And my senators, not just one, every representative. I've got in West Virginia is not representing me. None of them. They voted to take away my health care. They voted to take them down, tear down my kids, my grandkids' futures. I'm not taking it. I'm not taking it. And my fellow West Virginians, we're not taking this. In our country, we're not taking this. Stand with us. Mr. Sykes, I've heard these propagandas, entitlements versus investments. Are we an investment or are we an entitlement, Mr. Sykes? And I want to know, my senator's hollering, oh, this will raise the deficit. Well, look, my grandkids will be paying for it. Well, my grandkids are in poverty. So you tell me, does my grandkids have a future or do they not? I, I need to know, am I fighting a losing battle or have I got a country with me? That's right. That's right. That's right. Unpack it, Dr. Sykes. He says it's deficit, it's going to destroy everything, and, and, it's going, and if we do this, it's going to hurt our grandchildren who are already hurting. <laughs> what, what's, what's the truth? In, you know, is this an, are folk entitled when, they, when we do this? Or is this ought to be what we do? Talk to Pam and all people like Pam. Thank you, thank you, thank you for, for the fight and for your words, which are so right and so important. You know, if, if the government spends something, but it taxes that amount, there's no deficit, there's mm. no debt. That's the whole basic point. So if you say we're going to help with dental care and eye cares, or we're going to have a community college, then what you should ask is, okay, can we pay for it? by, for example, taxing Elon Musk and his friends? Can we pay for it by reversing some or all of that 2017 tax cut? Mm. That's the basic thing that one would do for decency around the table. They would say, it's your grandchildren and grandchildren all over the country and my grandchildren also, like your grandchildren. And I can't tell you how much I love them and want this country to work the same like you. And then you have five people in this country right now, maybe it's six, I think it's five, have a trillion dollars among themselves. If, yeah, no, you can't even imagine if it's Elon Musk and, and uh, Warren Buffett and uh, Bill Gates uh, and uh, Jeffrey Bezos and uh, Larry Page and Sergey Brin, maybe it's uh, six. It's about a trillion bucks. By the way, you can look it up online every day because Bloomberg.com tells you their daily wealth. So I'm kind of a billionaire voyeur. I like to see what's, what's happening because I know what they could pay for. Mm. And so that's a trillion. So, okay, that's five people. They don't need all of that, by the way. The good people of West Virginia probably know you could get by Elon could probably get by with just one. You could make it with just one billion in your bank account, couldn't you? Yeah. Yeah. Dr. Sykes, He's got I? 312. 
Can so, I say something? Because yeah. I'm, I'm trying to compute. I'm slower than you on these numbers. You, mean, you just said there were six people that had a trillion dollars. And how, how many people in this country? 400 and some I mean, and you and We're 330 million. People. And they're telling us that 330 million. million can't even afford two trillion for 10 years. And you just said six people. I mean, I, the stuff is so weird, I want us to slow down and see what we're hearing. It's completely weird. Because all that we're talking about that they say they can't afford, aside from the fact we could take it from so many places, from military, we spent seven trillion, by the way, in, in the wars, which I'm sure people here yeah. suffered from that. For nothing, by the way, all based on lies that were clearly lies from the first moment, I just have to add in. That was seven trillion down the drain. Seven trillion. And then we can't afford it? Are you kidding? We're spending two billion a day on the Pentagon. For what? For the next war they're going to cook up? What's the point? Then you have five or six people with a trillion dollars in their bank accounts right now. Just five or six people. The billionaires, a few hundred in our country, have many, I think it's about eight trillion for all the American billionaires, something like that. Mm -hmm. I don't remember mm -hmm. exactly. It's, it, this is so, and, and as I said, maybe a simple way to think about it is that it's just a little more than half of 1% of our national income for everything in here. And they say you can't afford it. Oh, it's, it's socialism, it's this, whatever crazy thing, because they're playing with us. They're playing games with us. They own the process, they own the committees, they own the votes. They, they themselves are rich. They are with the big money. They're with the lobbyists. So they're playing games and they say whatever humors them. So can we afford it? Of course. Can, can your grandchildren have a future? Of course, we need to do everything to fight that they have a future in this country. By the way, just a, another weird point, since, since Manchin absolutely has, you know, he's, this is another issue about mining, by the way, and, and the future of jobs. We're going to a different kind of economy. Already, the mining sector has the number of jobs very small. And to the extent that it's going to be mined, it's going to be machines anyway in the future. So we need a different kind of economy. If someone knows it, they do something about it. So in the last couple of days, big new project in Tennessee, the uh, Ford Motor for electric vehicles. Kentucky the electric vehicle batteries. Where's West Virginia in this? Manchin's just saying, no, I'm, no, we're not doing any of that stuff. Because in addition, since he owns coal companies, he's not looking to the future even for the jobs of this state. He's not bringing in investment. He's not looking for the future economy. And all around you, that's where the jobs are going to go because we're going to have that transition. But he is looking after his own company. That's all it is. It's nothing more than that. And so he's not talking about the future jobs. So it's just, it's another part of this whole story. It's weird. You, normal people think about their children and grandchildren. Right? That's, in fact, almost all we think about. <laughs> and then you say, what can we do to make sure that this world's going to work for them? That it's going to be safe? That they're going to have an education? That they can grow up safe? That their mom doesn't have to leave them someplace dangerous because she can't afford not to work or she stays home and then can't work and they grow up in poverty? What kind of choice is that? That's what we're doing. It's just crazy. And you people are the experts. You know what this is really like. 
You're the experts, not me. I know the numbers. You know the reality. The reality yeah. And the Congress doesn't care. That's the problem. And we have to make them care. And we have to, and you've got beautiful voices to do that. Professor Sachs, I, I have a follow-up question to, to what you were just responding to Pam. You, you said that you know what, the way to avoid spending into a deficit is, is by taxation of the, those that really can afford. It's by reducing a military budget, giving less money to the Pentagon um, to, to declare war. Um, and by the way, you could cut drug prices because the government spends a lot on that. Mm -hmm. and, and the drug prices, by the way, we have another case of the Manchin family and drug prices. Uh, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit known because they've been in the business of get price gouging for a long time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So you cut those prices, then you can afford a lot too. Mm -hmm. that's right. It's a game. Mm -hmm. What I couldn't figure out, just to, sorry to interrupt, I know since I, you know, I'm an economist and I teach at Columbia University, I meet a lot of these rich people. I don't understand, honestly, all they care about is their mansion in the Hamptons. But what kind of life is that also? It's so weird to do this so nasty. But they are completely obsessed with that. And that's what's there. It's a little crazy. But and so anyway, it's uh, this is what we're after. This is what we're after. So the other question I have, if, if as an economist, if you could speak to the the benefits of investing, the benefits of 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 investing in in childcare and in education, economically. I mean, we know some of them in terms of uh, socially, morally, that that it's the right thing to do. But but also, is it of economic benefit for have a society paying workers more? Is it of benefit? to the whole economy, to, to have kids going to good schools and, and child care. I mean, is, is there an economic side of that story, or, or is it just the right thing to do and we can do it so we should be doing it? Both. And you know, just before we were coming, I was doing a, a Zoom meeting with the uh, Minister of Finance of Paraguay, because uh, uh, my team has done a report for him. And the words I said just as I was leaving is, Minister, the most important investment that Paraguay can make is in education. Believe me, your whole economy depends on this. By the way, it's an easy line for me to remember because I say it everywhere. Because there's no, look at the young people here. Get a good education. I promise you, it's the most important thing possible. It's. It's the key for how the whole economy functions. And without it, with all the changes taking place, all the jobs that are going to disappear, all of the E this and E that, without an education, it's going to be a real, real problem for any child that doesn't have a decent education now. And all, all the economics points that way had a rising gap between college and non-college. This state has about the lowest bachelor's degree I mentioned as a proportion of the population. You're feeling that. That's hurting a lot. Mm. A lot. That's why, my God, you should have two senators that are saying nothing but that every day. We, Mr. President, we must get education to West Virginia and build up the universities here. You have universities across the state that can play a wonderful role and expand the enrollment, expand the training. Boy, then you'll see not only decency, well-being, a future, but economic returns. Companies coming in saying, okay, we'll build the next advanced technology here. That's what you want. But that takes skilled workers. That's right. By the way, without skilled workers, it used to be there were jobs. They're not jobs because the machines have taken those jobs. It's pretty basic. 
and it's been going on for decades. And in some places, they adjusted by making sure everyone could get decent skills and education. And in our country, no. So we have a growing, growing amount of poverty. And the political system just resists it because it's so corrupt. So it makes sense economically. We're gonna we're gonna produce numbers. You know, for those of you, one of the numbers is uh, something like three hundred and some plus billion dollars would be added to the economy if you raise the minimum wage to fifteen. And I think a group of Nobel Peace Prize economists just came out. They won the won the Nobel um, this year, and they basically proved what well, we knew it. But they said, look, we've done the research. It won't hurt jobs. It will not cause massive unemployment, it's not going to cause mass price hikes, and it's actually beneficial. And so again, you know, to invest in your people, you know, it, 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 now I'm from the deep country, uh, Dr. Sachs, and you know, my grandmother wasn't an economist, but she said, if you want to make a, a bitty into a chicken, you got to feed it. If you want to make a pig into a hog, you got to feed it. If you want to make a kitty into a cat, you got to feed it. And it's the same thing with people. It's the same thing with an economy, you know. And and you know what? You know you, it must mean it must be true because they want to be fed all the time. Problem is they're overfed, and they don't want to let anybody else benefit off of it. You got another person wants to come. Yeah, I think we got. Um, yeah. Mr. Ricardo Martin. Um, Actually, we got Jean. We're going to wait on Ricardo. Yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. Jean. Yeah, that's time. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Dr. Barber. Okay. Brother, the team will get it. Don't worry. They, they okay. got it. That's what they did. They'll get it. They, they're the, masters at fixing stuff. <laughs> the twist, the, the plastic ties you go in and hook them a jig, that's the kind of stuff you need. It'll keep it up there. Thank you. Uh, this is really exciting. This is interesting. Uh, it's good to know that people are ready to finally listen to some truth instead of the crap you've been hearing for so long. Instead of the crap that I think too many people have been accepting and pretending and hiding and going along with it. I'm a West Virginian, and you are too, and I don't appreciate it one bit. You're going along with crap, and you know it. You know it. Anyway, I didn't come up here to do that. I came up here to talk about the infrastructure. I want, I'm just going to present the situation, and then you'll tell me about it. Okay, thank you. Uh, that infrastructure bill is gonna put billions of dollars into the roads, water, infrastructure, solar panels, wind farms, batteries, electric vehicles, and more. Um, how would this, how would, excuse me, how would this spending, especially on clean energy, which we know some people don't like, some people named Mansion, how is that going to impact coal production, uh, which is uh, a concern for some West Virginians? Some West Virginians, born and raised here, I know the difference. I know what used to be, but what isn't happening anymore, and it stopped long ago, as you said a long time ago, mechanization started taking over many, many years ago. So how is it going to help the economy here? Thank you, Jim. Let me tell you about a, a terrific idea that eight mayors had in this region. And uh, we haven't gotten the White House to listen, and Manchin has absolutely run away from them. He refuses to listen. So eight mayors, and I, I can't remember all of these cities, but uh, it's uh, Louisville, Morgantown, uh, Pittsburgh, uh, in, in Ohio, in Kentucky, uh, in, uh, um, in Pennsylvania, in West Virginia, got together with uh, also the universities in, in the states and came up with a plan for how this region could become the leader of the new economy the leader for the clean energy, the leader for, just like I said, the Kentucky plant for uh, electric vehicle batteries, 
the leader for building wind turbines. This is a great industrial area. Mm. And if a little bit of care was taken by your politicians, which they're not doing, they would come forward with the plan. And they'd say, look what we could do, because we helped build this country, and we can help build the 21st century of this country. And here's a plan, and here are universities ready to do it, ready to help. It's going to be hydrogen, it's going to be electric, it's going to be wind turbines, it's going to be, uh, it's going to be solar, it's going to be clean energy. And this region could be at the core of it. And I worked with the, I worked especially with the mayor of Pittsburgh, Mayor Pedu Bill Peduto, terrific person, really wonderful person. Uh, and he got together, the other mayors got together, industry got together, technologists got together in his city, uh, Carnegie Mellon and uh, U, uh, U Pitt. I can tell you, it's a great idea. I went to the White House to talk about it with the, with the President Biden's uh, senior officials they're interested. They couldn't get Manchin to sit down on it. Mm -hmm. That's the damn truth. He's not putting forward anything. He's just in the business of saying no. That's the game. He's not looking out for the future. He's not showing you any plans for this state. He's not showing you the future jobs for this state. He's not showing you where education's going to come from. He's just telling you we can't afford to do anything for you good people. Because I have to protect my bank account, my Maserati, my houseboat, and my friends. That's it. Mm. So there is a great answer. They called it the Marshall Plan for Middle America. You can look it up. Terrific idea. Because George Marshall came from this region. That's right. A great, great American. So how about a Marshall Plan for this region? I'm all for it. This region built America, and it can do it again. But you need a plan, not a, and a leader, and not senators that run away and say the whole thing, no, 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 my state has to remain poor. That's what he's telling you. No jobs, no school, no help, just poverty, because we can't afford to do anything different. God forbid a company should pay a tax. God forbid a billionaire should pay a tax. That's the trade-off. Mm. It's not worth it, Dave. Mm. So you said six, or was it eight, eight mayors? Eight mayors. From this area, yep. not in West Virginia, but around, and, and, West and, and West Virginia, yep. and the one senator wouldn't even come to the meeting and sit down I mean, this is the kind of truth, America, because, see, the problem is he's hurting West Virginians, but because of this power structure and this ridiculous filibuster, and, and uh, he, he's hurt, taking the hurt from West Virginia bad enough here and spreading it all over the country. He's going to end up being like, um, Liz, what was the president before Roosevelt? Um, Herbert Hoover. Herbert Hoover. And Herbert Hoover messed up everything, took us into a deep, dark, the prey wasn't him by itself, but as the titular head, as the head of the nation, the president, between what he did and some of the mess that Woodrow Wilson did, it created where we ended up. And his main problem was he didn't know to do something that's when right. you're in the mess. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what we remember him for. Can't do anything. Can't do. That was his, like, can't do. Can't do. And Manchin's more, it won't do. Because he actually, I believe, knows, but he, he wants to keep everybody poor in West Virginia except his folk and his family and his group. And he's smooth. I mean, I watch, he'll, he'll have a meeting. I will tell y'all, Liz, you remember when we had our first meeting before 15, we had West Virginians, Dr. Saxon, they came on 
And he, first he didn't want to meet with us. Then he wanted to choose who could meet with him. And then he met with us and he said, oh no, oh no, I'm, I'm for living wage, I'm for living wage. And I've got a plan and I can get there quicker than everybody else. And he's been so used because you all have said from West Virginia, you are so surprised he's being challenged now because for so long he didn't get any challenge. Nobody stood up. Now this poor people's campaign and others in West Virginia, many, many others are standing up. And this is new for him. But he's so been so used to, or he'll have a, I saw where he had a meeting with one African American and one other person, and, and, and he got them to say something favor, and he hurried up and tweeted it out. Because he wants the facade that he really does care. And, and, if, and as what Professor Sachs has shared with us today, what it has also said, I think, Liz, to us, though, is think about this, because we've gotten some hard truths here today. And almost the kind of truth that could make you live in despair, except for one thing. What is the one thing that, that he fears? Y'all. He fe if he worked, see, if somebody works so hard, he fears us having hope that we can change and a fight for hope because, you know, hope is not just when people say it's going to be all right. One definition of hope is when people come to the conclusion that they're willing to suffer underneath something to change it and make it better, and they have the possibility to do it. They have the power to do it. And he's so, and, and, and we have to understand, if they fight this hard to meet with us, if they fight this hard to change the voting, if they fight this hard not for your voices not to be heard, then that tells you your power. That says that's what don't you don't you know what you can hear all of this truth, and you don't have to be in despair because if you didn't have power, they would just meet with you. If you didn't have power, but they fear that, and that's why we we must do what we're continuing to do and West Virginia must lead the way. There's no way, we got no way in the world you all should just lay down when you got the potential for 346,000 children in the state to get the child tax credit and you've got the opportunity for uh, hundreds of thousands to get universal pre-K and 888,000 to get paid in family medical leave. And we just, the numbers, the numbers keep, just keep growing, just growing and growing and growing. And, what's, and, and, and this is with a three times compromised bill that's, that's $9 trillion less than what we really ought to be doing. See, I want to understand, if, if a, one, the, the one seven trillion can do this, imagine if we had followed like Sachs' proposals or the EPI's Economic Policy Institute's proposal, or even the three trillion. Right, and and I think too that's another reason why he doesn't want even the one trillion to happen, because folk just might get that kind of hope. They might see, hmm, if this this little bit can make this much difference, what would really happen if we had a fair and a just society? Now, I, I know again as we because we got to wrap up because we've been on a long time, but it's been so powerful. People are calling in everywhere, but. Um, I know they fear you because we got word, and, and I shared it with Liz. Liz shared something with me, and I'm going to say it, and y'all look at her, though, because if she said, no, they didn't say that, then that means I'm lying, right? <laughs> but she said that we got friends from one, I call one of our partners, uh, Common Defense, and they, and they told, y'all look at her, they told, come, watch her head, see, they told Liz that they were told by Manchin's office that they would meet with the veterans if the veterans would stop showing up with us. That means they fear. Huh? This campaign and poor low wage. Now, I was told, it got back to me, Dr. Sachs, that the handlers of, Dr. of President Biden, and, and, and I blame his handlers, but we're going to send this letter because there's a point at which you, a president has to say to their handlers, no, you're not going to handle me like this. I want to meet with those folk in West Virginia. You can't keep putting it off on your handlers and the scheduling. Okay. Right? There's a point at which the president has to say to a senator, I'm going to your state because those are my people too. I'm president of the entire United States. You can't tell me I can't come to West Virginia or Arizona. But we would, it got back to us that they said they would meet.
And y'all need to know, I send this stuff directly, what you're asking, to Ron Klein. I don't send it to somebody. Ron Klein, the chief of staff, has your demand. Cedric Richmond has a demand. They can't say that they haven't had it at the highest level. I don't send it, to, we don't send it, it is not through some, some book private person. But it got back to us that there was a conversation and it went something like, well, we might, we, we could consider meeting with the Poor People's Campaign. One thing, but let's meet with them after we get it done. In other words, then they can just talk about what they did, but we don't get a chance to shape what was done. Secondly, it was said, but we might not want to meet with them because they might bring the wrong kind of poor and lower people. The, now I'm telling you, it hurt me so bad. See, so I can't, you know, as a preacher, and I'm, if I say certain things, that would be the story. So I have to internalize a lot of words because <laughs> I don't want to mess up the movement where the focus becomes me what I really want to say sometimes, so I have to ask the whole, but they said the wrong, that were, but now they're going to deny they said this, but it got back to me from a pretty high source that we might bring the wrong kind of poor and low people, and they won't poll well. And if the, if the TVs show them, it will be a turnoff because they won't, rep they won't look like, what in the, see that, see that's, that's that kind of attitude. Right? But that's why we can't back up. And that's why right now I'm going to ask Jean and um, Pam to come uh, to read this letter. And I want to ask, first of all, those of you that are here, how many of you, has this been good today? Yeah. And, and um, are there any rapid fire questions where you can just stand up and say it so we can then, we'll get it answered, but we, we got a, our live stream is getting tight. So is there a rapid fire question? Anybody got a rapid fire that you'd like? And we'll get it put in writing and send it out. Say your name. Ricardo Martin. Right, okay, Brother Martin. Not only is this a, a rapid fire question, yes, sir. Yes, sir. I, I need you to know if you don't already. Uh, speaking about health care. Mm -hmm. The CDC, in conjunction with Robert Woods Foundation, issued in Newsweek several years ago, mm -hmm. the 50 cities in the country that had life expectancy below the national average. Uh -huh. Think about it. Below the countries, national average? Below. Okay. West Virginia had five wow. of the 50. This is the lowest life expectancy of the state, state level. And, 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 and that is, that is d depressing. Not only that, but... but and that was five years ago. That was just a few years just ago. Just a few years that, ago. That, that article came out. Right. Not only that, but, but Dr. Sachs, uh, 484 census tracts in West Virginia. Okay. And you have to check, though, you have to fact check me on this. 1,592 uh, block groups, 135,218 census blocks. The great majority of, of these census tracts have poverty levels 20% and above. 20% and, and above. Now, now to, you have to fact check me on the number of the, uh, of the percentage of the 484 uh, census tracts, but I think it's, it's 40 or higher, 40% or higher of those census tracts. Poverty, 20% and above. Now, here's my question. Mm -hmm. um, let me, let me get it up here. That's all right, Doc. That's technology. Uh, uh, Senator Manchin has talked, Dr. Sachs, a, a lot about how the cost of these programs will add to the deficit and increase inflation. He hmm. seems to be trying to sell the myth of scarcity, scarcity in one of the more resource-rich parts of the country. Can, can you unpack that a little bit, Dr. Sachs? Yeah, let me unpack one thing, which is I'm looking right now at the, the Centers for Disease Control. West Virginia has the lowest life expectancy in the whole country. They need to, you have that sorry, West Virginia has the lowest life expectancy in the whole country. Many, many years less than other states. Where is Manchin on this? 
Say that Eric. one more time. We want everybody to hear that. West Virginia has the lowest life expectancy of any state in the United States. Wow. You just check out the Centers for Disease Control. It's shocking. It's right, right here. And it's, uh, it's a tragedy. It is solvable, but it needs resources. And it needs some politicians that give a damn. That's the point. And he knows it. He knows, of course he knows. Someone, he can't, as he runs away from people, he somehow hears it echoing. But he won't sit down to solve any of it. Hmm. So this is, this was the original, that the slash, 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 the health part of all of this. Unbelievable. With Manchin in the lead. Oh, we can't afford health in our state. What kind of nonsense is that? Hmm. Really cruel. Mm. This is life and death. Life and not death. Just, not just dollars. Life and death. Mm -hmm. And he, even that can't can't get a rise out of him. You all make sure you all push that out, that statement that was just said. Now, what about this thing about those? Now they're trying to scare everybody with inflation. If we do this, it's going to cause all this inflation. Yeah, the, the, the main point that I keep emphasizing is if his concern is the debt and deficits, then he should understand, he should champion the tax increases on the richest people in this country and the corporations, then his problem goes away. Right. Very simple. Very simple. You mentioned Elon Musk this morning on the news. We can't hear you. You got a good mic. Yeah, yeah. You got to use a mic. I use a mic. I use a mic. Because of people. You, you mentioned Elon Musk on the, uh, he was on the news this morning. Good I didn't, morning, I didn't see that. Good morning, Mark, the day show. But they made mention of how much he would owe in taxes. Did you, did you? I didn't catch that, no. Millions. Yeah, yeah. Millions of dollars in taxes. And they went on to say he indicated. Millions, I would expect. He might be willing to pay. Yeah. <laughs> Say a little bit more about that, Dr. Sack. Is there a question to that? Look, it's known that all these mega, mega billionaires didn't pay tax on the way up because the tax system is designed so they don't pay tax. So, and then there was a release, uh, you know, some leaked uh, files a, a couple months ago, ProPublica showed it. Uh, some of the richest people in the world. They didn't pay tax on the way up. So this, this is what we're facing. And then there were proposals uh, a couple weeks ago that they should pay some tax. And it wasn't even a lot that was being asked. And then Manchin said, mm, no, I don't, I don't like that. And that was the end of it, supposedly, because that's what a closed room is. Well, what about us? Why don't we get a say? Why don't the American people? Because if you look at the opinion surveys, the overwhelming majority of the American people want these people to pay taxes. That's not a secret. So how can, where's... But what's, also, what's with our president? Let him speak to the country. That's right. Where's his fireside chat? Where is his trip to Charleston, West Virginia? To rally support. That's politics. Bring people in, not the back room. That's right. That's democracy. And then he'd hear an earful, because all across this country, an overwhelming majority of people are onto it. They got it. They get the game. They want the game to end. They want their grandchildren to have a future. They get it. Yep. But that's why they're keeping us out completely. Mm -hmm from the process. And they know the game is coming to an end. It's it just is win. coming to an they end. Just, they know that's it. That's why they have to cheat on the votes, just like That's you right. Said. That, that's the whole point. When people do this, and I remember in South Africa, they said, the mothers used to say, many times what you're seeing is the dying gasp of an ending reality. When you see, when folk have to cheat in the back room, when you got to cheat to win, that's, your, that's the proof that you're afraid that you can't win straight up. So you got to rig the votes, you got to do this in the back room, you have to cut the monies because this country, it can't stay forever with nearly 50% of the people in poverty and low wealth and they sure enough fear 
black and white and brown and native all coming together, uh, particularly around an agenda that will address poverty and racism and ecological devastation, denial of health care, all of that together. That's why somebody said we, they might bring the wrong poor people. But guess what? We come in anyway. <laughs> we come in anyway. You either bring Muhammad to the mountain or the mountain come back. We come in anyway. And not for a day. And we, that's why we're not having the gathering in, in D.C. on like a historic day of the past. Because people might mistake and say, oh, they just came because it was the anniversary of the March on Washington. Mm. Or they just came be, just to remember what happened. We're distinctly doing it. And it's going to be more than a day. And it's going to be organized in this declaration because we want folk to be clear. We have to stop this on our watch. If this nation cannot face these things after COVID and all these deaths, what is it going to take? But the total unraveling of the society. If you can't have a conscience after this, and so we are the ones and West Virginia has got to lead and be out there in the front of it, right? Because I said to somebody the other day, I think it may have been Dr. Lipscomb. Thank, he could well, give him a hand. He just came in, had some church stuff he had to do today. Watch, watch, excuse me. I'm sorry. The watch. But he, um, uh, forgive me, my mind. But he um, was, we, we, I think we were talking one day, and I said to him that, you know, if, if, if the same kind of voter suppression bills are being passed in West Virginia that are being passed in Texas, then it can't just be race. It is race now. Don't you ever mistake it. You can't, you can't deal with America without factoring in the race piece. And I think, Dr. Sack, that's another piece we have to factor into this, is that every time you hear people calling stuff entitlement, that's straight out of the Southern strategy. That's straight out of, of Richard Nixon and, and, and Kevin Phillips and all. Because a lot of this stuff, what they're really saying is, you don't want all of these black and brown and other folk um, um, receiving this. You know, people forget Franklin Delano Roosevelt had to make a decision, even in the New Deal. And that meant my grandmother and grandfather couldn't, they had to make a deal that if you were in the agrarian culture or the domestic culture, you couldn't pay in. Well, who were the most of the people in that culture? Black folk. They didn't get to pay in until 54. So we've always had these race decisions. You can't dismiss racism, but you also cannot dismiss the economics of it. And this voter suppression we see today is about race and economics. 56 million Americans used the processes to vote in the last election that will be taken away in states. And let me tell y'all something, straight up. They didn't expect that win in Georgia. And that win probably wouldn't have happened in Georgia if Trump hadn't went down and act so crazy. That's why Manchin signed on to most of the bills he's now against. Because the goal was to sign on and give the pretension that he was for it. But as soon as the votes changed and they could actually vote on them, the real side came out. The real deal came out. He signed, he told John Lewis, I'm with you. On the, I'm with you. I guarantee you he never ran in a primary or went to a black or white church during the primary and said, elect me and I'm going to make sure you don't get a living wage. I would bet my life that he never did that. And I love me some living. <laughs> I would bet you he never stood up on the, on the, uh, on, on the cameras and said, elect me and I'm going to make sure you don't get health care. He probably said, you know, if it wasn't for that state legislature, we would have health care all the while in the back room, see? And once the things changed, there was an article how the Chamber of Commerce called him, started calling him, giving him awards, putting this stuff, said, now you got to show your real hand. And so he's actually been forced to do what he never really wanted to do. But to keep those donors and stuff, he had to do it. And that is be against the very things he signed off on Lee. Y'all hear what I'm saying? But the fear is, anybody that won't meet with you, that means they fear you. So I think we got to have a meet in America. <laughs> I think we got to have a great big meet in West Virginia. So, so on Wednesday, 
at three, I had all three of Manchin's office and all across the country. Right, right, Rob, help me out. We're having witness Wednesdays at the senators' offices across the country. So it's not just Manchin, it's all the, everybody, any of them. All those. In fact, he's hiding about six moderate Democrats. Y'all need to know. He and Cinema are just the, just the points. But it's about six others that also don't want, but they, they sat around and figured out who could get away with it. But they're not moderates, they're reactionaries. That's right. They're not moderates. I don't even like the word moderate. That's a whole other story. I don't want to start preaching in here, Doc. <laughs> but my Bible says something about lukewarm. <laughs> so I don't, I, Liz, I let Liz, she's a New Testament scholar, do that. But every, so in Charleston, Fairmount, and Martinsburg, Martinsburg, people are going to be in front of his office, joining folk all across the country. This Wednesday, Witness Wednesday. And then next Monday, we're going back to D.C., front of the Capitol. Something's working out. People from all over the country, different organizations, state, right when they say they're going to pass this on Wednesday. And people say, well, Rambo, why are y'all pushing for it to be passed? It's not all you want. Well, we come from a people that didn't always get all they wanted, but that didn't mean they stopped fighting. See, it's, what's transformative about this is not that it's the largest ever happened since Great Depression. That's actually kind of shameful to say that. If, if, if you actually stand up and say that 1.7 trillion is the biggest investment in these areas since the Great Depression, that's kind of pitiful. <laughs> you know, to even say that. But what the, what's transformative about it is it's a narrative shift. It makes folk have to admit that these problems are solvable and they're solvable by investment in it. And that's why we are pushing. We're not for 1.7. We push for more. But we're not going to let them take that off the table. You know, we're going. How many of you all remember the days of segregation? And, and particularly after Americans, see, my dad has said this is how they looked at segregation. They took segregation and those old schools, and they went to school in there, and they learned the best they can. Then they got what they learned to fight the segregation. <laughs> Just because you accept a temporary thing does not mean you have accepted its existence. Sometimes you use what it offers to undo the entire system. And so by them investing in all this stuff, it forces a narrative shift that y'all been fighting for, right? That we've been fighting for. So you don't throw it all away. You fight for this and you keep fighting. Because of that, on next Monday, we're coming back to DC and we're gonna hear more about this. I wanna ask now, as closing this, I wanna ask Pam, uh, if y'all could give some mic to these folks. Pam, or either Pam and uh, And I want to ask uh, De Deidre. Now, Deidre, you my cousin. You know my grandma was a Keys? No. So we need, is it K-E-Y-S or K-E-Y-E-S? K-E-Y-S. Okay, yeah, that's the same Keys. So we need to have a conversation. Yeah. All right. So, so, so Deidre, and then Jean, and then Liz, and then, um, what did I say? Pam. Oh, Robin, Pam, Robin, Jean, Liz, Deidre, and then Reverend Casimir, Reverend Liz. Now, I've got the mark one here, okay? Take, give that one away. Take, use this one. And see, that's it, Pam okay. and Robin. And what did I say? Jean. Jean, just that section. That looks like Reverend. Then Liz, mm -hmm. and then Deidre, mm -hmm. and then uh, Reverend Casimir. Ain't that Reverend Casimir? Hello, young lady. What's your name? I know, but what's your name? You know I've been thinking you were Reverend Casimir the whole while. Are you from West Virginia? Would you mind reading a piece? Come on, come on. Y'all know that one. Y'all, why y'all didn't tell me that one? I didn't know that one. She looked like Casimir to me. Okay, so this is, that's for her. Okay. Okay, Deidre, Pam, Robin, Jean. Robin gonna lead it. So y'all come up here, and look. Eric, Eric wants y'all closer to this. All he right. keeps telling me, get everybody close so I can get them in the camera. All right, all right. And this is how we're going to close out. And at the end, if we can all stand, celebrate, and thank him for coming. Y'all glad he came yeah. with the truth. Yeah. Uh, Tammy.
you're going to start off. We're going to forward together, not one step back so when they end. Okay. Okay. To hear. And y'all okay. need it with okay. the vigor and the power of West Virginia. You want to pull your mask and up? A few no. Dear Mr. President, Mr. Biden, President Biden, we need a full Build Back Better plan in West Virginia. Our people are dying. Before the pandemic, 700 people a day died from poverty in, West, in America. COVID-19 took the lives of, of 4,500 West Virginians while poverty continues to ravage our communities. For months, we have watched you meet with senators and lobbyists as you work out a Build Back Better plan. After weeks of asking your staff to meet with us, we are asking, why? Why won't you sit down with us? We are West Virginia Poor People's Campaign. We are the 140 million poor and low wage workers in America. We are the 710,000 West Virginians who are poor and low wealth. We are the 351,000 West Virginians without a living wage. We are the 187,000 children living in poverty in West Virginia. We are the more than 108 thousand people without health insurance. We are the West Virginians without a senator, without a representative who represents us. We are mothers facing an empty fridge and no security for the next one on the way. We are the worker with two jobs who still can't afford safe housing. We are essential workers without health insurance. We are teachers on food stamps. We are pastors whose young people have passed by our doors on their way to hang themselves because they can't live in this poverty. We have asked Senator Joe Manchin to meet with us. We have called, petitioned, and stood outside his offices in West Virginia and in D.C. He refuses to meet with the very people he says he represents. He does not speak for us. You promised to build back better, but you need to know us to do it right. Why won't you meet with us? We are black, brown, indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and white. We are mothers and fathers. We are low-wage workers. We are not center-left or center-right America. We are not progressive or conservative America. We are America. We're pleading plainly now because this is our lives. Our backs are to the wall in West Virginia, and we are petitioning you. Meet with us. Hear our stories. We support infrastructure, but we also need an infrastructure for our daily lives. We need an infrastructure for our democracy, including full voting rights. We need a living wage with at least a $15 federal minimum wage. This is why you need to meet with us. We are coming to Washington, D.C. on Monday, November 15th. Invite us to the, the White House to meet with you in the Oval Office. We will gather representatives from other states, too. Then we can talk to the media together, because this is not a battle between your agenda and Senator Manchin's agenda. This is not about center left versus center right. This is about our survival, our lives, and our chance for justice, and promoting general welfare of all people. Remember, Mr. President, teaching, oh, teachings of Isaiah 10, Woe to those who make unjust laws, to those who issue oppressive decrees to deprive the poor of their rights. And Matthew 25, truly, I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. We are fighting for our lives here, and we are petitioning you for our deepest morals. Mr. President, will you meet with us? I'd like to ask Reverend Matthew Watts to come forward and lead us in prayer. Yes, yes. Can we all stand together? Can we all stand together and bow? 
Gracious God, our Father, we're so grateful for this another glory. It's a magnificent day you blessed us to see. We thank you, Lord, for our friend with the uh, National Poor People's Campaign and our family of the Western New Poor People's Campaign that's gathering here today. We thank you for our friend, our brother, Jeffrey Sachs, Lord, who's come to share uh, his knowledge and wisdom, insight about the economics of the Build Back Better plan and to dispel some of the uh, the lies and untruths that have been articulated. We pray that we will be the wise and the more insightful and to be inspired to continue to forge forward a full court press demanding economic justice, demanding a living wage, demanding the full funding of the Build Back Better uh, bill, demanding for the voters' rights. Uh, and we need this investment in the people of this state and the people of this country, Lord, who are deserving of an investment from its government so that they can reach their full potential and they can build this great nation to be much better than it's ever been before. So I pray that you would energize uh, the leaders of this movement, Pastor Reverend Dr. Barber and Reverend Dr. Liz, the O'Hare's father and their team, that they not grow weary in their well-doing as they travel all across this country to try to lift up a banner of hope and to challenge the people to rise up and to fight for justice for themselves and for their families. So we pray as we leave this place, we not depart from your presence, but we be even more determined and resolved to continue to fight. Uh, we ask your blessings upon us. In Christ's name, amen. 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 We have a protocol we want to ask everybody to follow because we're still having COVID. We ask people not to gather and talk inside, but if you want to have conversation to step out to the outside, so if I walk past or somebody, some of us have still have immune deficiencies, don't get offended. But it's just a protocol we've been asked to maintain so that we can be safe. Can we do that together? So if, if you go outside in the parking lot, if you want to have conversation. But before we leave, forward together. Forward together. Forward together. Thank you so much. God bless all of you.